You're extremely active in national affairs at the moment, whether it's about an inquiry into the Iraq war or asylum seeker policy. Why the desire to be involved? It's not a desire to be involved, but a feeling about some issues um, where I think Australia is going very wrong, um, and issues I feel strongly about. The way we treat asylum seekers, people fleeing terror, destruction in their own lands, goes very much to human rights, goes very much to our obligations under international law, which we've signed on to, and also what used to be Australian law. But we've just changed Australian law in the most disgraceful way. Um, the Iraq war, well, it's time we stopped going to war being the province of one man. Um, a strong prime minister is not going to be denied by his cabinet. If our prime minister has said, oh, well, President Bush, we're with you, of course we're with you, uh, I'll have to get cabinet approval, of course, then cabinet approval is a formality and one man has taken us to war. It may not be in our interest. It was not in our interest to be in Iraq. It's not in our interest to be in Afghanistan now. Iraq's a failure, Afghanistan's a pending failure. And um, we need to stand up on these issues. I want to focus on the asylum seeker issue. Mm. How were your views on this shaped? Was there something definitive that happened in your life? Well, I, I believed and still believe Australia needs more people. Somebody who's fleeing terror in their own land deserves help. Menzies signed on to the Refugee Convention in 1954. If you like, uh, in my view, a quite significant move, which meant that the White Australia policy was going to have to go. Nobody said so at the time because Australians were still wedded to that, that sort of policy. But little by little, it was broken down and ultimately totally abolished. But I think after Vietnam, we had given commitments to South Vietnam. They had not been fulfilled. Many people were at risk because they had worked with us or fought beside Australians. And so I think we had a special obligation to them. And uh, so tens of thousands of refugees came and that's turned into a, a vigorous, vital, um, and uh, enormously rewarding community uh, in many parts of Australia. Has the nature of asylum seeking changed from the time of Vietnam to now? Well, our attitude to it has changed, certainly. But the people fleeing are fleeing from the same sort of motivation. I don't really see all that much difference between um, Indo-Chinese fleeing, because they weren't all Vietnamese by any means, the Indo-Chinese um, and people fleeing Afghan in the, uh, Afghanistan because they feared the Taliban when they were in power or they fear the Taliban would be back in power. If you're a family with a couple of girls growing up, you want them to get educated, you want them to have a life. You educate them illegally with uh, maybe a female university professor no longer allowed to work but that becomes dangerous, and I checked under the Taliban. The penalty for that was to shoot the whole lot, the teacher, the girls, the family. What option has that family got? Go over the border and get into a refugee camp in Pakistan that's got two million people in it, or try and get on a boat to Europe or to Australia. Why do you think the coalition's policy on asylum seekers continues to garner such widespread public support? I don't know that it does get such widespread public support. But you see, what Even happened... the government seems to support the coalition's oh, asylum know, seeker policy. I know, but they've policy. both run away from principle. They're both uh, behaving like rotten apples, rolling around in the bottom of a barrel of rotten apples. Um, Look, we used to tell it as it was. These are people who will fit into Australia and this is what they're fleeing from. And when Australians learnt that, I still meet Vietnamese who say when they got to the places where they were billeted in Adelaide, 
There'd be clothes for the children, toys for the children, waiting for them. A warm, generous welcome. But now, after Tampa, the government of the day started saying illegal, queue jumpers, evil people, wrongdoers, prostitutes, drug runners, and probably terrorists. Now, if you've got senior ministers going on saying that day after day after day, obviously the attitude is going to change. So you feel and that the public is being hoodwinked? There's certainly been deceived on many occasions, children overboard. People knew the truth of that issue at the time. And to say, look, these are people who throw children overboard, such people shouldn't come to Australia. Well, um, you know, it says a great deal about the politicians saying that, because what reasonable person would assume that a mother would willingly throw their child overboard? That says somebody about the person making the allegation, much more about that person and his inappropriate or her inappropriateness to be a politician, to be a leader of Australia. Have you spoken to John Howard about this personally? What's the point? I know I can't change his mind. What about Tony Abbott? Have you discussed his policy with him face to face? Oh, some things face to face, but not for a very long while. Um, when he knew I'd resigned from the Liberal Party, but it wasn't public, he came into my office two or three times trying to get me to change my mind, you know saying all sorts of things about how much he admired me and blah, blah, blah. He tried to get you to change your mind. He tried to get me to change my mind, but um, the arguments he used were not really believable and they were wrong anyway. And I'd made up my mind because it wasn't a quick decision. And the party had so departed from basic liberal values, the tenets of the, Mil uh, of the Menzies Liberal Party, which was a truly liberal party. So is Tony Abbott a liberal no, or a conservative? No, of course not. But they say they're conservative. Proudly. Yes. If you had called Menzies conservative in the Australian context, he'd regard it as an insult. He really would have. It wasn't an accident that the name the Liberal Party was chosen, a liberal was chosen for the Liberal Party. He wanted a forward-looking progressive party willing to make experiments, in no way conservative, in no way reactionary. Do you think Tony Abbott is leadership quality? Is he a good leader? Well, I don't want to make this a personal discussion about Tony Abbott. The party have thought him to be a good leader. You described the asylum seeker policy of the coalition as, as evil. But the Labour policy is now the same. The policy that has actually been introduced is harsher than the hard policy. Which is why I, I'm keen to know whether you feel that he'd make a good leader, or is he saying these things because he knows it will appeal to people? Oh, he thinks they're voting issues, voting issues obviously. Now imagine what Australia would be like today if we hadn't had the Greek, the Italian, the Eastern European, migration, the migration from nearly every country in the world now, including from Asia and South Asia. Uh, we're so much a better country. We're a broader country. As a people, more broad-minded, more open-minded. There's greater culture in our cities, more life in our cities. Now, the Vietnamese migration would not have been possible with today's political leaders because somebody would have tried to play politics with the issue. And a politician who's got any respect for his profession will not play politics with the lives of the most vulnerable people in the world. It really is a despicable thing to do. Do you have any respect for Tony Abbott? I don't have respect for people who play politics with these issues. I really don't. And that's not an issue on which I can compromise or will. I would like to see a colour-blind government, a colour-blind Australia, where you just look at a person and judge them for what they are, that you try to behave to that person as you would like other people to behave to you, which many people call the golden rule of civilised behaviour.
the values which are important to a civilised society are really universal. They're not uniquely Australian. I, I think you could make a, a strong argument that our politicians have let Australia down very, very seriously because we like to regard ourselves as an open society, a compassionate society. But how is it that our politicians have thought, no, we've got to play politics with asylum seekers. We've got to tell Australians what terrible people they are so that Australians will be hard-hearted and not generous, not compassionate, not concerning. Because if we tell them how bad they are, what awful people they are, then we can win votes on the issue. So. Does it concern you that Australia could soon be led by Tony Abbott? Uh, I'm concerned about the government that we have now, and I would be concerned that Tony Abbott government would no more deserve support than the current government. Not an optimistic place to be? No, not at the moment. I don't think it is. Because when you look around the parliament, um, how many people have achieved things in their own right before they became politicians? So many from Labour and Liberal went to university, I want a career in politics, what will I do? Get a job with the party, get a job with the union, get a job as researcher for a member of parliament, build up brownie points, get them to support me, get them to help me get pre-selection. Now, such a person has no real confidence, um, probably owes obligations to all sorts of people who have helped him get pre-selection, therefore does what he's asked to do, does not exercise independent judgment, which is what he's paid to do and which is what people voted for him or her hoping he would do. And you know, I, I know a very distinguished QC in Sydney human rights lawyer, constitutional lawyer, would have been an adornment to the Liberal Party or the Labour Party, but he actually stood for the Labour Party, I think twice, but certainly I know once, and got beaten by one of these young apparatchiks who worked for the Labour Party was then an opposition, so an opposition, front bench opposition person in, in the Parliament. And I said, oh, for heaven's sake, how did he beat you? Oh, Malcolm, I guess they believed I'd be a little independent. And I would have been. I said, but that's what you should be. Do you suspect that Australia today bears some of that leftover, the hangover, if you like, from the white Australia policy? Is this why there is some difficulty with accepting asylum seekers in the way that perhaps you'd like to have them accepted? Uh, I think some hangover, yes, but also, and, and this might offend a lot of people, Australia has been a dependent nation. Now, from foundation of Australia to the Second World War, we were dependent on Britain for our defence. When we really needed help, Britain was beleaguered and quite unable to help, fighting for her own survival. So we turned it to America. We said, please help us. But we have depended upon America ever since. I want to see an Australia that has enough courage to say, look, we are going to be independent. We are going to make our own decisions. We're not going to go to war in far off parts of the world which are wrong wars, illegal wars, misconceived wars, just because you, the United States, ask us to. And we're not going to allow ourselves to become a military bastion in your mistaken policy to encircle, contain China. Um, but we are still being dependent. We're doing what America wants us to. We, we, we need to really grow up and understand what we could be, what we should be. It's interesting that you haven't brought up the issue of a republic in this discussion about de being dependent? Well, it's, it's, it's a peripheral issue, in a sense. Um, I want to see Australia become a republic. I think we're going to have some difficulty in finding a model 
that Australians will willingly accept and which won't at the same time establish two power centres in Canberra, which would be a disaster. Um, but uh, being independent, people do not realise the extent to which we have been entwined in the United States policy in the last 15 or 20 years. At a time when the Cold War is over, the United States is now in the process of establishing a new Cold War in the Pacific. Her military policies failed in Vietnam, failed in Iraq, failing in Afghanistan. The Middle East is a mess, and leaving all that behind, they say they're going to shift their forces to the Western Pacific. We are part of this part of the world and we don't want to be part of America's future mistakes in this region. But has the government been frank with Australians, saying where it might lead, saying that we're going to be asked to pay for a lot of it? It's America trying to tie us into their policy of containment, which is about the most dangerous position Australia could possibly be in. You've said this has been chewed over. Gough Whitlam has written that you didn't set out to deceive him. How important to you in your lifetime has it been that you and Gough, in a sense, had a, a, a rapprochement, a meeting of minds? Well, I think it's not only important for him and for me, but I also think it's important for Australia because it shows that two people who on one or two issues, and it was really on economics and on due process, we really had quite extreme differences. But on a vision for Australia, on the idea of an independent Australia, on equality for all people, of a fair go for all people, of freedom of information, uh, of human rights legislation, uh, Australia's relationship with the world, Goff went to China first when he was Prime Minister. My first visit overseas, I went to China because I wanted to give a message that this is where I went to Japan, China. This is where Australia is. This is where Australia's future uh, lies and, uh, and upon which it will depend. So Goff had grand ideas, many of which were very good ideas all about the future of Australia. He was a visionary. Yes, he was. He spoke about multiculturalism, but I gave multiculturalism form, shape and substance. And in spite of some people not liking multiculturalism, you've only got to walk down any street in Melbourne or Sydney to know that we are a multicultural nation and no politician can change that. The other question I've always wanted to ask you, have you ever felt sympathy for the treatment of Sir John Kerr? Oh yes. He, I think, uh, was intensely concerned to do what he believed to be right. He wanted to be well thought of in history. He was really placed in an extraordinarily difficult uh, position. Um, and the, you know, the Labour Party never forgave him. I can understand them not forgiving him, but um, it struck at the core of his mind and his heart, I think, in a, a very, very severe way. Um, maybe he wasn't a, a tough enough or a hard enough person to, to throw all those differences aside and still go on with life in a reasonable way. Um, so, I, you know, he did what he thought was right, but it led to many, many unhappy memories for him. Do you want to be well thought of in history? Well, I, I suppose at my age, whatever historians write about me has pretty well been written, um, unless medical science can advance a bit. Yes, if history thinks well of you, that's, that's fine. But history has thought well of some pretty disreputable characters at times. Um, maybe more important to try and do your best and know you've tried to do your best for yourself. I mean, not for yourself, but 
that you yourself know you've tried to do your best and have stuck by ideas or principles or a vision of Australia which you think is important. Are you, you try, content? You try, hmm? Are you content on those grounds then? Um, no, not really, because I think Australia has gone backwards. The vision that Whitlam had and I had about the future of Australia has gone backwards, and we would both have believed it's gone backwards. And so, you know, what could we have done to make sure that that doesn't happen? The lesson to be learnt out of this is that important issues, an attitude to race or an attitude to religion, things that can divide a society, so much. You can't win the victory forever. You can win it for your time, for your time in office, your time in power. But then if somebody comes along and tries to play politics with the lives of vulnerable people, they can do a community, a people, a country immense harm. And when your own time has passed, how do you prevent that person coming along? How do you guarantee that there are always going to be good people there who will not play politics with the wrong issues? And you can't. But do you feel you succeeded in your own time? I think so. I would like things to have ended up better. It would be nice to get out in your own time and not being dismissed by the people of Australia. Um, but I understand the decision they made, and I think I understand why they made it. Uh, but important things like the idea of multiculturalism, um, of Australia having a view of the world and having a role in the world, um, the rule of law, due process, um, trying to strengthen ordinary people's access to the law and to see that people did get a fair go. Um, if you had your time over again, you could always do better. <laughs> but that's, you don't have the luxury of, uh, of being able to have the experience and then use your experience to do better the next time round because that time has passed. Indeed. Malcolm Fraser, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for speaking with OnePlus One. Thank you.